Thank you, Rob Feaster, for that beautiful prelude. Amazing grace. We're going to sing about that in just a moment. Welcome to Sanctuary Worship on this third Sunday in August, live and in person, as well as live stream. We're grateful that you've chosen to worship our risen Christ here today. Andrew's Harvest needs your help. Please take a shopping bag out in the lobby after worship and shop the list. It will make a difference for the more than 200 guests that we will welcome this coming Thursday. More than 50 families every single week with more than 25 volunteers gathering the food and serving our guests. It will make a difference for people who need help and hope in Jesus' name. Today is back to school splash. It'll be right after the 11 a.m. worship. There will be hot dogs and sausages on the grill. There will be chips and lemonade and lots and lots of water. You have time to go home and change into your bathing suits. Please come back. It'll be worth your time. Altar flowers are a blessing. Chris and Diane Knight have given the bouquet today for the glory of God, and we are grateful. The white rose is in honor of the life of Dennis Lawrence Sr., Pastor Denny Lawrence's father. He entered the life eternal on August 17, 2022. Our special music today is Bill Banker. Our song leaders are Stephen Wanda Brinkerhoff. Back on the soundboard, we have Chris Knight and David Hanley, and we have our wonderful streaming team, John Gillespie and Gary Riley, working with Carol. Our ushers at this hour are John and Cheryl Parsons, Sharon Marchino, Joyce Greider, and Betty Hederwick. Now welcome your worship leader, Jackie Light.
Good morning. morning. The psalm reading this morning is from Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and do not forget all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good as long as you live, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works vindication and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for being the one who heals us. Thank you for making your priorities clear. Thank you for your compassion and your power. Thank you for healing the man with a withered hand, even on the Sabbath. We know, Lord, that you said the Sabbath is for people, not people for the Sabbath. Help us, Lord, to know how to honor you as we honor the Sabbath. Teach us to work towards your will and rest when we need to. But we also pray, Lord, to help us to know when we need to join you in your work of healing. May we be a channel of your restoration in the part of the world you have sent us, all God's people say. seated. Our reading this morning is from Isaiah 58. If you refrain from trampling the Sabbath, from pursuing your own interests on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight and the holy day of the Lord honorable, if you honor it not going your own ways, serving your own interests or pursuing your own affairs, then you shall take the delight in the Lord. And 
I will make you ride upon the heights of the earth, and I will feed you with the heritage of your ancestors Jacob. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As you are able, our gospel for today is from Luke chapter 13. Now he, Jesus, was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and was quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. When he laid his hands on her, immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, There are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, You hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to give it water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound for 18 long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? When he said this, all his opponents were put to shame. And the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things that he was doing. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please be seated and welcome Bill Banker.
Thank you, Bill Banker. It's time now for the children to join me here on the steps of the chancel. All children of all ages are welcome and invited. Grown-ups must come accompanied by a child. So come on down. Good morning. Thank you for your faithfulness in giving to the treasure chest. It's going to help the kids over at Winchester Village School. And as we remember, they come from so many different places, and they don't have a lot of stuff like we do. Well, are you coming on down, Natalie? Good. I'm going to tell you today about what it was like when I was a little boy. When I was a little boy, on Sunday, we went to my grandparents' house after church and Sunday school, and we had dinner. And after dinner, we got to sit in the living room and be quiet. <laughs> Can you imagine that? My grandfather wouldn't allow the TV to be turned on. We weren't allowed to go outside and play because that wasn't keeping the Lord's day. There were no stores open. There were no movies to go to. There were very few restaurants even. Sunday, you had to sit and be quiet. If we got to play a game at all, it was checkers. And we had to be quiet when we played. Those were rules that everybody followed when I was a little boy. Now, today, can you go shopping on Sunday? Sure. Can you turn on the TV on Sunday? Sure, it's on all the time, isn't it? Can you play games? Can you go swimming? Yes, you can do all kinds of stuff on Sunday. Well, why did we have all those rules? Well, my grandfather believed that that was keeping the commandment, which is remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. My grandfather believed that meant you couldn't do anything but rest. Why have we changed so much today? Well, I think it's partly because people have forgotten who God is. In the story today, we have Jesus doing something amazing on the day of rest, the Sabbath. And everybody got mad at Jesus because he did this amazing thing. He healed this woman. They said, no, that's doing work. You shouldn't do that on the Lord's day. And Jesus says, no, wait a minute. God made this special day for people. And can I help people on this special day? They just didn't get it. And the thing they didn't get the most was who Jesus is. They thought he was just somebody who could do stuff. They didn't see Jesus as God with us. And they didn't understand God wants to love us and help us and most of all do good things for us. Isn't that wonderful news? So here's what I figured out since I was a little boy. Keeping God's Sabbath, Sunday, the Lord's Day, is not so much about keeping the rules. It's about remembering who God is 
and who God loves. And God loves especially people like that lady who was hurting so badly, she came to Jesus for healing. And God loves her so much and us so much that Jesus healed her. And she went away well. Isn't that good news? So anything you can do on the Sabbath that shows God's love for us in Jesus and that is helpful to other people, I'd say that's a good thing to do on Sunday. So if you're going to go swimming, you might offer to help your daddy get the pool set up. Or you might invite a friend who doesn't have a swimming pool to go swimming with you. That could be fun. Ready to pray? Help me, Jesus. Remember who God is. God loves us. God helps us. God wants us to love God. Amen. Thanks for being here. God bless you as you go. Today in our series on No Fear, we're going to talk about how wonderful Jesus is. City of Light is a musical group that is the house band for an Anglican church in Sydney, Australia. You don't think of Anglican Episcopalian churches having house bands, do you? But Australia is a different place than the United States of America. And this Anglican church, St. Paul's Anglican Church, Sydney, has this amazing group that writes and sings songs. You can look them up, City Alight, capital C-I-T-Y, capital A-L-I-G-H-T, it's one word, City Alight. This is their song about the good and gracious King. I approach the throne of glory, nothing in my hands I bring, but the promise of acceptance from a good and gracious King. I will give to you my burden as you give to me your strength. Come and fill me with your spirit as I sing to you this praise. You deserve the greater glory. Overcome, I lift my voice to the king in need of nothing. Empty-handed, I rejoice. This about sums up the miracle that Jesus did this Sabbath day in the synagogue. That desperate woman came to Jesus with nothing but her pain, her bent over body, and her desperate need. She came empty handed to the one she trusted that loved her so much he would accept her, a woman, on the Sabbath in the synagogue. I mean, you do know that a synagogue was composed when there were ten. Jewish men had nothing to do with women. But she came anyway, trusting and believing who Jesus was for her that day. Trusting and believing he would welcome her and show her his love. And he did. But it says at the beginning of the gospel that what Jesus was in the synagogue to do was teach. Teaching. Do you know how many teachers have quit teaching since the pandemic began? School systems are in crisis all over the country because teachers are saying, it's not worth it anymore. The pay's not worth it. The difficulties we endure in the classroom with discipline the trouble we have with administrative support, the absence of parents supporting their children, it's just not worth it anymore, especially for what they have to do to earn their license and then how little they get paid once they've earned their license. So teaching is in crisis in America. It's not something we're talking a lot about, but we're going to bear the fruit of it in a few years. Right now, the United States of America ranks in the world 14th 
in reading in public schools, 17th in science in public schools, and 25th in mathematics in public schools surveyed. We rank behind countries like Belgium, Estonia, and Poland. Huh? Well, haven't we all heard about all of these efforts, these government rules and regulations and teaching standards and testing standards? Haven't we heard all about how everybody's working so hard to make it better? But in the last 30 years, teaching in America has not brought us any higher on worldwide standards. Charles M. Payne of the University of Chicago put it this way, so much reform, so little change. He recommends that if we want to improve the quality of education in America, we have to stop spending so much time on what teachers do and more time on who teachers are. He says in America, the average teacher spends 1,080 hours per year in required instruction, like what the state legislature in Indiana tells a teacher that they have to teach. In South Korea, which ranks in the top three educationally in the world, teachers on average only spend 600 hours a year in instruction. That's a huge difference, isn't it? But South Korea emphasizes developing who the teacher is much more than what the teacher does. They say the model is more like developing physicians, attorneys, people with PhDs. It's developing the person to be someone that is well looked up to, modeled, admired. And in America we're all about what's done. It's called the factory model by the way. It's about a process that will result in a product that we can market. Well that's not the teacher Jesus who was on the hot seat in the synagogue that day on the Sabbath. Now, as far as the Pharisees was concerned, it was about what Jesus was doing. And they were sure that what Jesus was doing was breaking the Sabbath. I mean, what did he do that was so awful? Well, he healed. The Sabbath rules that had developed from the time of the fourth commandment in the days of Moses, which is honor the Sabbath day and keep it holy, they were really, really intricate and explicit. You could not walk more than 50 feet. You could not carry more than the equivalent of a penny in your pocket. You couldn't carry a thimble and a needle in your pocket because that meant you might go to work. The rules were binding more than when I was a little kid in my grandfather's house. And I got to tell you, I hated Sundays in my grandfather's house. Because the TV did not go on until after sundown. Now, it was something that we look forward to because it was Disney's wonderful world of color in black and white. <laughs> but you just didn't do anything enjoyable on the Lord's Day. And I hated the fact that my father had to buy the Saps Donuts down at the corner store on Saturday and they'd be kind of stale on Sunday while the Catholics got to go to Lenny's Bakery and get fresh donuts on Sunday morning because they got out of church long before we did and they ate them all before we got a chance to get there. And the only store that would be open would be the Economy Rexall Drug Store. And that was only for emergencies and prescriptions. Don't go in there and expect to buy some toys or something. Because the druggist would tell you, no, 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 you should not do that. 
By the time I was a kid, Sabbath keeping was just like it was in Jesus' day in the synagogue. It was about rules, and you dared not break them. And nobody ever explained to me why we kept the rules, that God was worthy of our reverence, that God had ordained a day of rest. Nobody ever bothered to tell us. They just said, obey the rules or else. And so, Jesus broke the rules. Not because he liked to do stuff that made people mad. It was because of who he is and who he was. And there was no way that Jesus could let a crippled woman bent over for 18 years come to him for help, and he was going to say to her, well, you wait outside till tomorrow. That's not who Jesus is. Um, synagogue rulers came to Jesus, by the way. I mean, they didn't universally dislike him. We have that wonderful story of Jairus, whose daughter was dying, and he came to Jesus for help, and Jesus went to his house and healed his daughter, raised her from the dead. And Jesus wasn't an enemy of the synagogue. He regularly went to synagogue. It says in Luke 4, as was his custom, and he was made to teach. He would read from Scripture, as in that Luke 4 passage. He read from the prophet Isaiah, and he said, this is the day of God's favor. The blind are given sight. The prisoners are set free. The captives are released. God loves you. It's the time of God's acceptance. And then his friends in Nazareth were waiting with bated breath. What are you going to do for us? You've done it everywhere else. What are you going to do for us? And Jesus said, well, a prophet is without honor in his own hometown. And they got so mad at him that they grabbed him and hustled him out of the synagogue to the top of the cliff and were ready to throw him off. And... It wasn't time, so Jesus just turned around and walked away. But he didn't go back. Didn't go back to the hometown and the home folk. Didn't give them another chance to be blind to who he was. On Luke 14, in Luke 14, Jesus was going to the house of a Pharisee, Pharisee leader to eat dinner on the Sabbath. They were watching him closely. There was a man there who had dropsy, and I think that means fluid retained. I'm not sure. My grandmother used to talk about dropsy. And Jesus asked the lawyers and Pharisees, is it lawful to heal people on the Sabbath or not? And so they were silent. So Jesus healed him and sent him away. And then Jesus said, if one of you has a child or an ox that has fallen into the well, will you not immediately pull it out on the Sabbath day? And they could not reply to this. Jesus is referencing a passage from Exodus 23. It says, even if your enemy's ox or donkey has strayed, you must return it. If you see the donkey of someone who hates you, who's fallen down because of its heavy load, don't leave it there. You must help even your enemy. Deuteronomy 22, if you see your brother's ox or sheep straying, you must not ignore it. Be sure to return it to your brother. Proverbs 24, don't gloat when your enemy fails. Don't let your heart rejoice when your enemy stumbles. Proverbs 25, if your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. And if he is thirsty, give him water to drink. And Jesus was also pointing out the Pharisees' problems. In Matthew 23, he said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! By your actions, you lock people out of God's kingdom. 
you won't go in yourself and you keep everybody out. Again, Matthew 23, woe to you scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You will cross land and sea to make one single convert, but once you make him, your rule keeping makes him twice a child of hell as you are. Matthew 23 again, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites. You tithe even the mint, dill, and cumin, but you neglect justice and mercy and faith. What is Jesus saying? He said, you're so meticulous on keeping the rules. You have forgotten the one who gave you the rules for your benefit. The tithe was about honoring God with the first fruit of your harvest and produce. The tithe was about helping the scribes, the Levites, the priests have something to celebrate the Passover with because they didn't have an inheritance in the land. It was about having the foreigners among you have something to celebrate the, the Passover because they didn't have an inheritance in the land. It was about helping people. And they'd lost sight of the fact that everything we have is a gift from God. And when we return it to God, it's not to keep a rule or to feel like we have an obligation. It's to do good things to help people and so see God through what we do. But most of all, Jesus was hoping that his people would understand the Sabbath equals freedom. That woman was set free that day. It was fully in keeping with what the prophets understood the Sabbath to be. Prophet Isaiah, stop bringing your offerings, your incense and your sacrifices, and your new moons and Sabbaths and convocations are an offense to me. God is saying that because it wasn't about God anymore. It was about keeping rules. And the prophet Amos says, God hates your festivals and takes no delight in your solemn assemblies, not even your offerings. I won't accept them because you won't care for the poor. Let your justice roll down like water. Philo of Alexandria was a first century, comparatively same time as Jesus, Jewish philosopher. He called the Sabbath the birthday of the world. Philo's notion on the Sabbath is that when we keep the Sabbath, it sanctifies the rest of the week because it starts us focusing on who gave us everything God. Karen Maine says what we have lost in modern world is we have lost the cycle of Sabbath keeping and so we're like a world that has been ravaged, defoliated, and deforested spiritually. We have become a dehydrated people because we don't have a spiritual well to draw from. We are dwelling in desert places of the soul because we've forgotten that God said, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. And Karen Maines goes on to say, Jesus pointed us to the radical equality among all human beings that the Sabbath is. He welcomed a woman who wasn't welcome in the synagogue. He healed this woman when doing this kind of thing was forbidden on the Sabbath. That's the radical welcome and equality of God. It's not what God does for us. I ask uh, 10 people, why are you a Christian? And they'll say, well, because Jesus Christ died and rose again from the dead. Why did he do that? Because he loves us and wants us to be free from sin and death. Why are you a Christian? Because Jesus forgives me my sins. 
Why did he do that? Because he loves us and doesn't want us to be bound by sin and fear. Well, I believe in Jesus because he's coming again. Why is he coming again? Because he loves us and he's promised to come and take us to be with him forever. You see, it's not about what he does. It's who he is. He's the one that loves us no matter what. While he was lifting up the host in the Mass in 1980, Archbishop Oscar Romero of El Salvador was shot at the altar from a sniper outside his church. For 30 years, the people of El Salvador worked to get Oscar Romero canonized as a saint. And for 30 years, the Roman Curia blocked every effort to get Oscar Romero canonized. They said he was a politician. They said he was aligned with liberation theology. They said he was an advocate of chaos and dissension in his native country. But what was Oscar Romero really? The first one of the bishops of El Salvador that was native born, the first ones of the bishops of El Salvador who advocated for the desperately poor in his country, the first ones of the bishops of El Salvador who used church assets, wealth, to help the poor, the first one of the bishops of El Salvador to dare to stand up to the 18 families that owned El Salvador. Finally, Pope Francis declared he died a martyr killed by those who hate the faith of God in Jesus Christ. That's a pretty profound statement, isn't it? Hate the faith of God in Jesus Christ. If we have faith in God, who is Jesus Christ, God with us and for us, we have to have the heart of Jesus. It's a heart for the blind, a heart for the captive, a heart for the poor, a heart for the not welcome, a heart for the overlooked. We have to know who Jesus is if we intend to worship our good and gracious King. Oh, what grace that you would see me as your child and as your friend, safe, secure in you forever. I pour out my praise again. You deserve the greater glory. Overcome, I lift my voice to the king who needs nothing. Empty-handed, I rejoice. You deserve the greater glory. Overcome with joy, I sing. By your love, I am accepted. O oh, my good and gracious king. Kurt Vonnegut, remember that Vonnegut family of Vonnegut's Hardware here in Indianapolis, Indiana? Remember Kurt Vonnegut, the author, who's a native of our state? Kurt Vonnegut said, For some reason, the most vocal Christians never mention the Beatitudes of Matthew chapter 5. Often with tears in their eyes, they demand that we keep the Ten Commandments, that they be posted in public buildings, and of course, that's Moses, not Jesus. I haven't heard one of them demand that Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, Beatitudes, be posted anywhere. Do you ever see blessed are the merciful in a courtroom? Do you ever see blessed are the peacemakers in the Pentagon? You deserve the greater glory. Overcome, I lift my voice to the king of need of nothing. Empty-handed, I rejoice. Rich Mullins, Christian musician, wrote, Christianity is not about building an absolutely secure little niche in the world where you can live with your perfect little wife and your perfect little children in your beautiful little house where you have nobody who's different from you and no minority people anywhere near you. Christianity is about learning to love like Jesus loved. And guess what? Jesus loved the poor, the broken, and the not welcome. You deserve the greater glory. Overcome, I lift my voice to the king in need of nothing. Empty-handed, I rejoice. 
Neil Gaiman, author of American Gods, wrote, there was only one guy in the whole Bible that Jesus ever personally promised would be with him in paradise. Wasn't Peter, wasn't Paul, wasn't any of those guys. No, the promise was given to a convicted thief about to be executed. Don't knock the people on death row. They know something the rest of us have forgotten. We're all on death row if Jesus isn't our Lord and our Savior. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Holy God, Remind us of your great love for all people, shown to us by the example of your only Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Grant us, by your Holy Spirit's power, to care for and work for the good of all the people you love, especially those who are oppressed in mind, body, or spirit. Grant us courage to take our stand in Jesus' name for them each day. And so we pray for the ones who are struggling and suffering, for Jim Pittman in Community South Hospital, for John Bales in Community South Hospital, for Jackson Bingham suffering with a flare-up of his ulcerative colitis, Shirley Haynes suffering with cellulitis, Marilyn Thale, suffering through rehabilitation therapy, and for John Morris and Becky, as they're both now at home. For John, for Libby Bales, for Joe Best and Kenny Joe Brown, for Don Holstein, as he takes radiation, praying for hope, and for Mary. For Jim Campbell, receiving ongoing therapies, and for Barbara, for Roy Cowan, as he's had an important doctor's visit this week, and for Kim. For Sandra Brown and Emerson in his eyes, for Stephen Allen and Marty Agresta, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. For all who are struggling with advancing age, especially Norma Jean Stone, Charles and Mary Lou Hilton, Maxine Croker, Diana Boyce, Louise Hoagland, Joanne Reed, Wes Michael, Betty Hendricks, Helen Lucas, and Betty Higgins, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. At the death of Dennis Lawrence Sr., we pray for his grieving son, Pastor Denny Lawrence, and all his family. At the death of Donna Clark, we pray for her grieving husband, Larry, her grieving son, David, her grieving daughters, Luanna and Jeanette. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. As we pray for our public safety workers who guard us and protect us day and night, we pay them little attention. We complain when they don't do what we want. But Alex Stock and Charles King and Tim Clark and Mark Riley, Damon Cox and Brandon Carr and Jay Noble put their lives on the line for us every day. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. For our military families, loved ones who are in putting themselves on freedom's front lines for our nation's safety and defense. Kara McDowell at Great Lakes in Chicago with the Navy. Logan McLeese at West Point, New York with the Army. John Abbey and Wyatt Campbell in California with the Army. Kelsey Page and Briar Orr in North Carolina with the Army, Ben Morphew aboard the USS Mustin with the Navy, Chris Benitez in Texas with the Army, Joel Keats in Arizona with the Air Force, Rob Bolin at Fort Lewis, Washington with the Army, Shane Dickey with the Army in North Carolina, Logan Van Blarkham in Virginia with the Navy. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. For our missions and missionaries, brave women and men who put their lives on the line in far foreign places to give the help and hope of Jesus. 
Lowell and Claudia Wirtz join the harvest in Tanzania. Jay Malin Pei Williamson, Zanmi Fandwa in Haiti, Mission Guatemala, Daryl Wanda, Jeremiah and Taryn Fulp, Hope for Home in Guatemala, closer to home at the Indiana United Methodist Children's Home at Lebanon, where the children are just starting school, separated from homes and families, seeking a safe place to learn and study and Fletcher Place here in the city, and Andrew's Harvest at our own front door where hungry people will come this Thursday for help and hope. In Jesus' name, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For all who are incarcerated, who work in prison settings, Adam Hall and the inmates at Newcastle State Penitentiary, Jerrica Patterson working as a therapist at the Terre Haute Federal Penitentiary. We pray for the inmates there, especially the ones on death row. And for Kairos Prison Ministry, working with prisons all over Indiana to share the love of Jesus. For all the grieving in Buffalo, New York, in Uvalde, Texas, Highland Park, Illinois, Greenwood, Indiana, in the Ukraine, in Sri Lanka, in Eastern Kentucky, and especially for all the women in our country. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. And so we pray for all in authority over us. President Joe Biden, Governor Eric Holcomb, Mayor Joe Hogsad, Bishop Julius Trimble, and Conference Superintendent Dr. Elise Fulbright. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. And so, with the confidence of the children of God, we join our voices praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
missing all our college kids. They've started classes. They've gone away to campuses. So please be praying for them through these days without them. Pray for their safety. Pray for their being able to keep their noses to the grindstone and do their work. We pray that their families will be able to go see them in timely ways. Pray especially for Logan McLeese. He finished basic training at West Point. He's now in class, and he says it's the hardest thing he's ever done. Now receive this blessing and dismissal. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, bless, preserve, and keep you. And God so graciously look upon you and fill you with all spiritual benediction and love that you may show the love of God to somebody this week. Somebody who doesn't know the love of God. Somebody who doesn't want the love of God. Somebody who doesn't deserve the love of God. Show them that love in Jesus. And we all say, Amen. Amen.